This is the Monday, March 28th, 2016 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new interview every Monday morning, as well as Classical Wisdom Wednesdays and History in Five Fridays. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Authors Show on iHeartRadio. You can also catch us on iTunes, Spreaker, Player FM, and all sorts of other personal audio outlets. Today, we're stepping through the Guardian of Forever and back to a time before there was America in North America. Our time machine is going to colonial America, just after the Salem Witch Trials. Our guide on this journey is Jay Atkinson. Men's Health Magazine called Jay the Bard of New England Toughness, Due to his approach to writing and the topics he chooses, today, Jay is sharing the story of another tough New Englander. In his new book, Massacre on the Merrimack, Hannah Dustin's Captivity and Revenge in Colonial America. Early on March 15, 1697, a band of Abenaki warriors in service to the Catholic French raided the Puritan English frontier village of Haverhill, Massachusetts, killing 27 men, women, and children and taking 13 survivors captive. Hannah Dustin and her one-week-old daughter Martha were among those survivors, and it is there that her story begins. Jay Atkinson teaches journalism at Boston University. He's also a critic, essayist, investigative journalist, and itinerant amateur athlete up in Methuen, Massachusetts. He is also the author of two novels, a collection of short fiction, and five non-fiction narrative books, including Ice Time and... Legends of Winter Hill. You can visit his website, jatkinson.com, follow his Twitter handle, Atkinson underscore J, or drop him a like on facebook.com slash writer J Atkinson. Okay, now that we know a little bit about our guide, let's head back in time with J Atkinson to the days of King William's War and meet Hannah Dustin. I'm joined now by Jay Atkinson, author of Massacre on the Merrimack, Hannah Dustin's Captivity and Revenge in Colonial America. Thank you for making the time to talk with the History Author Show today. It's great to be with you, Dean, and with your listeners. I really have been looking forward to this interview, and I'm really excited to get Hannah Dustin's story out to a wide audience that you represent. Well, thank you, and thanks to your sister. She's letting you use her landline phone today because, I guess, being somebody who writes in history, you just had to go back to sort of an older-style phone. We are not together in the same (laughs) studio. (laughs) I am in New York City where we had a little bit of a dusting today of snow, and I find that after I read Massacre on the Merrimack, I just can't ever complain about it. I kind of hear Hannah Dustin and the people who lived back then, not to mention the Native Americans who would have been suffering through the snow. You just feel so weak when you complain complain about any sort of bad weather, but it was snowing indeed, and I started thinking about my first question, and I started to think about you in the back of your dad's station wagon, and just what a vivid image that is of a certain period of American history. I think any of us of a certain age can picture laying in the back of that. It was not too long after the space race kicked off, and it was just so American and a family trip. You felt like you were in your little space capsule there. So take us back to when this spark of inspiration hits you for what becomes Massacre on the Merrimack. What did you see when you first saw that statue of Hannah Dustin and asked your father just who she was and why they'd built this woman out of stone? Yeah, so now, I mean, I'm a professional writer. I'm hopefully mid-career. This is my eighth book. 
At the time, though, that I first heard Hannah Dustin's story, at least a very short, abbreviated version of it, I was probably 10 or 12 years old, an avid reader. I was certainly interested in the terrain around us in New England and spent a lot of time outdoors, especially as a kid and even in the winter, and skating on ponds and hiking in the woods and doing things with my friends in our neighborhood, which was fairly rural. I live in Methuen, Massachusetts, in the northeast corner of the state bordering New Hampshire. And the town of Methuen, which was officially made a town in 1726, was originally part of the larger town in terms of landmass of Haverhill, Massachusetts. So Haverhill borders on Methuen now, and I grew up thinking of myself as separate from Haverhill and Hannah Dustin's town. But if you look back at their early history, 1697, when the raid on Haverhill took place, Methuen and Haverhill were the same town. So as a child, we would pass through Haverhill. When I was a child, my family would pass through Haverhill on our way to the beach to go to the ocean, to go to usually either Salisbury Beach in Massachusetts or Hampton Beach in New Hampshire. And my dad was absolutely convinced that you would go the two-lane back roads that he went as a child and not the interstate highway, that the interstate highway was always crowded with cars. The place could be totally devoid of cars, but he wouldn't listen. He would take the two-lane. So the two-lane wanders along the Merrimack River through the Pleasant Valley section of Methuen into Haverhill and then over the Singing Bridge and up the hill in downtown Haverhill past the police station, the fire station, the city hall, and the library. And on the left-hand side, on the western side of, the, of Route 110, as you ascend that hill, there was a very startling and unique and certainly idiosyncratic statue, a large, life-size, blue, oxidized statue of a woman in colonial garb holding a hatchet in one hand and pointing downward and to the left with her other hand. And sometime on one of those many trips we took when I was a kid, I was probably in the back of the station wagon, not only with the five children in our family, and I'm the oldest, but maybe some one of my knucklehead buddies from the neighborhood. And I said to my dad, who's that? Like, what's with that statue? And my dad gave me, with a stub of a cigar in his mouth, the windows rolled down, the sweltering heat, and one of his beach hats on, gave me the shortest history lesson in history. <laughs> and that was, that's Hannah Dustin. She killed the Indians. Now shut up back there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was interested in storytelling then. I didn't realize, and nobody had yet encouraged me to uh, become a writer. But that story persisted with me from the age of 10 or 12 when I first noticed the statue and asked my father about it. Up through my incipient career as a writer, I just started writing for literary magazines and doing a little bit of journalism work. And as I got into my career writing books, alternating between fiction and narrative nonfiction, typically, I have a sense now that, you know, I have a limited amount of time. There's a lot of stories out there. And I need to really select and choose carefully a story that I'm willing to give like three years of my life to in this case. And it turned out, in, as I did some other stuff that had sort of a historical underpinning to it, this became the right story at the right time. I wouldn't say that I'm a professional historian. I'm not even a, an academic, really, although I teach in the College of Communication at Boston University and have for several years. What I am and how I see myself primarily is as a storyteller, and Hannah Dustin's story from late in the 17th century in this corner of Massachusetts is one hell of a story. It really is. And from the very beginning, there's not a lot of the background that maybe people associate with a straight history. This really reads like a thriller, somebody said in one of the reviews, I think on Amazon, maybe or somewhere like that. And I can certainly vouch for that. The opening scene it's and medias res. I mean, it's exactly like fiction. Start in the middle. You open it, and here's the raid. They're they're coming for Hannah Dustin's family. You're telling that from the point of view of her husband. We're sucked into it from the first moment, and because of the point of view, you can really relate. I mean, this is a family with a lot of children, and they're trying to decide who they're going to be able to save. So describe that raid a little bit. Hannah Dustin's captured with her infant Martha and their nurse at the time, as they would have called a, sort of a nanny, Mary Neff. So talk about that. Describe the excitement. 
Yeah, so for the last four years, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, on March 15th, I would be out in the woods just uh, northwest of Eudora Street in Haverhill in the proximity of where the Dustin house would have been located. And that house was burned down during the raid and it no longer exists. And it's very difficult to tell which of the old buried chimneys and foundations would belong to the Dustins. But it's also close by what's still there, which is the brick garrison house that the Dustins built after the raid with the money they gathered because of Hannah Dustin's actions during the raid. So what I would do when I was preparing to write this, and I wanted to create a sense of narrative reality, especially in the beginning, and like you say, begin the story in Medias Rays, like as Horace said in the Art of Poetry, he ever hurries into the midst of the crisis as if the crisis is already known, he being the storyteller. So I would be out in those woods in the pre-dawn hour and feeling the sort of iron chill of the air and looking at the tangled undergrowth and the patches of snow everywhere and think like this is what it was like when the Abenakis came down Little River, split into separate parties and attacked the outskirts of the community simultaneously. Now, although I don't explain this until after I give you the visceral you know, experience of the raid, at least I hope I do, the reason for the raid was it was King William's War, which began towards the very end of the 17th century. It was actually a war being fought in Europe between England and France over the ascension of a new king in England that a lot of the English uh, objected to because he was Catholic and the French supported that. So the colonies were asked to fight proxy wars. So even though there could have been treaties in place at the time between the French and the English colonies with the English settled in Salem and Boston and the French in Quebec, uh, and the Indian tribes, or the, you know, the Abenaki and the other Algonquin tribes would have been, you know, probably at peace if it wasn't for the war being fought in Europe. So essentially, it's a proxy war and the French are using the Abenaki warriors from the river tribes of Maine as mercenary soldiers. And the Abenaki would be working for the French during this period because the French were paying for captives and scalps and the English at the time were not. During other configurations of the loyalties, those same river tribes, you know, 10 years later or 15 years earlier, could have been fighting on behalf of the English attacking the French. At the time, to the misfortune of the Dustins, but something that will endure in history, is that Hannah Dustin's family was living on the northwestern edge of the community. They had a 20-acre plot. The reason why they were on the fringe of the community closest to the wilderness was they did not have enough money to buy their parcel of land down near the river where the fortifications were, where the wealthy people lived. So they had the misfortune of being the outermost section of the of the community in a farm that was not protected by a palisade, was not made of brick, did not have any fortifications. The Abenaki break into these small parties just before the sun comes up by a prearranged signal, usually a single rifle shot. They will attack in small groups of four or five at the outlying houses that were a half mile or so apart. They would attack simultaneously, and the goal was to take some captives to take some scalps to burn down some buildings and spread terror. I mean, it's a terror raid, essentially. When they attacked the Dustin house, they were also attacking the closest neighbors so they couldn't come to aid one another. It was a tactic that they developed over lots of internecine wars between themselves and other bands of Indians, that you would attack simultaneously at outlying areas so they couldn't come to support one another. Within probably 15 or 20 minutes, a group of Abenaki, and they would have been all seasoned warriors under the age of 30, inured to the cold, used to traveling long distances by water, even in the winter. And then in some of the research that I came across, they could cover five miles an hour on snowshoes. So they could run 12-minute miles in their snowshoes and put multiple hours on end. So they were a fierce, ferocious, hardened, and skillful lot and within just a few minutes, they killed 27 men, women, and children in Haverhill, and they took 13 captives. They would kill without any moment's hesitation a child, a clergyman, a pregnant woman. It didn't matter. Their job, the reason they were there, they were being commissioned to come down and 
make money for themselves by gaining captives for the French that the French could then resell back to their families later. So the French would make money from it more than once. And unfortunately for Hannah Dustin, she had just given birth to her child, Martha, a week earlier. For the first time, and this was her 12th child, she was 39 years old and the year was 1697. As the Indians raided in the pre-dawn hour, her husband Thomas was lucky enough to be outside of the farmhouse on his horse, tending to his fields with a weapon. He saw the Indians coming, and this is later corroborated when she has an interview with both Cotton Mather and Samuel Sewell to tell the story what happened. He saw the Indians coming, he galloped back to the house, he gathered up the other children. At the time, there were nine nine surviving children because two of their children had died young from illness. There were nine surviving children and a week old infant. Hannah Dustin was in the house. She had not been feeling well. It was the first time that she did not pop up immediately after her pregnancy and begin, you know, helping with chores. So she was being tended to by a 51 year old neighbor, Mary Neff. Um, Thomas rushed back to the house, got the other kids running uphill back towards the main part of town to the closest uh, fortified house, which was the Marsh House, owned by a guy by the name of Onesiphorus Marsh, who had a detachment of militia that was about a mile away. Thomas saw that he wasn't going to be able to, just on one horse, with no other adult to help him, to save all the children, plus his wife, plus the infant, plus the neighbor. So some kind of decision was made on the spur of the moment where Hannah and Mary Neff and the baby were left behind for the Indians, and Thomas was able to get the children, which she didn't know this at the time, but he was able to get the children uphill to safety to the garrison house. After the Indians took Hannah Dustin, Mary Neff, and the baby captive, they burned down what had taken the Dustins years to build, the farmhouse and all their outbuildings, and then they started instantly back into the woods where they met up with other Abenaki that had raided other town, you know, other uh, farms in close proximity. And they had their captives and they would go from being loud and spreading terror to stealth mode and withdrawing through the woods. And within maybe a quarter mile of the dust and house, as they started to withdraw northward again, back into the wilderness, most likely the baby was upset and crying. And one of the warriors took the baby, swung it by its heels, and killed the infant Martha by smashing it against a tree. And then Hannah Dustin was left to decide at that moment whether she was going to drop in the snow, give up, and surrender herself to being basically murdered by the Indians, or whether she was going to somehow gather her resolve and continue on because they were being forced marched back towards France, New France. And she decided somehow that the death of her child was not only going to be something that wasn't going to kill her, but she was going to get her revenge for what they had just done to her child. And over the next two weeks, she plays out that revenge against her captors. It's a book that I am sure was a challenge to write and probably for people listening too, because you want to pick a side when you read something. And I think people will be very against this because they see, first of all, it's the French here that are the driving force. So these, This is not cruelty for cruelty's sake. But when I was reading the book, I found just in this little world where they live, as you said, not only do they kill 27 people when they make the raid, but there's an old man who sort of falls by the wayside there when they're doing this forced march to Quebec. They just leap on him and they hatchet his head in. Of course, she sees her infant also murdered before her eyes. I believe there's another woman there on the, on the march that just can't keep up. They tell her really cruelly that her husband has been killed and all of her children because she doesn't know that they're safe. So she's thinking she's completely alone. It it very much drives her here as you read it, if you try to read it with an open mind, just as a limited story here. Maybe not what we know comes before and what comes after, but she really meets them on their own ground. You write that Dustin herself becomes a savage, ready to inflict pain and death or suffer it as the circumstances demand of her. And I found it, I don't know, a poignant part of the story that the only person that she spares when she gets to Sugar Ball Island, where she finally turns the tables, is the little boy that shows her some kindness along the way. And to me, that was a moment where you say, well, she was in control. This wasn't just sort of a, a murderous rampage for its own sake. It wasn't just revenge. It, she seemed like she was just a fascinating woman. And 
Yet, of course, she was also a mass murderer. She killed all of these people because right. she wanted to get away. And I think if people wish to challenge themselves, this is a great book because you can read it and say, well, what would I do in those shoes? I mean, would I give up? Would I lay down in there in the snow and just die after I'd just seen give up. You know, right. uh, what would you do? She is a tough woman. She's a woman of tremendous faith. And I guess we maybe forget sometimes that Puritans were also kind of stoic about things. And she's seeing God's hand in this. She's trying to decide what she should do. She decides, well, I'm being delivered. And the only other helper she has, I didn't want to confuse the two, but they already have another boy that they've enslaved, which is Sam Lenorson. And he kind of helps when that old man is bludgeoned by the side of the trail there that they're walking them through the snow. Hannah's lost her shoe during the raid, and the boy runs back and gets the shoe and brings it to her so she has something to wear on her foot because there's no resting. I mean, she's at one point eating pieces of skin off the bottoms of her feet. And this is these are incredible details that you found. And by traveling this route, you really did walk in her footsteps almost literally. So tell us a little bit about that. How did you go about making this just so vivid that fact reads like fiction? Well, two things come to mind when you talk about, like, what is her justification and what was the Puritan justification for what she did? Because she didn't just, when she gets two weeks into her forced march and she finds herself divided into a smaller party of captors where it's just her, her friend from Haverhill, Mary Neff, and this boy from Worcester, Massachusetts had been taken by the Abenaki months earlier, Sam, there's just the three of them, but now there's only two male Indians, two warriors guarding her or, you know, spiriting her northward, five women and five children. So, from the 20th century perspective, it's hard for us to fathom, okay, we can understand that the two warriors killed her baby, so she's going to kill the warriors, and also they pose the biggest threat. So she's going to kill the warriors, but then why doesn't she just frighten the other people and, into silence and then get in their canoe and paddle away? It's hard for us from the 21st century to like justify that she bludgeoned to death women and children after killing the warriors that had killed her baby. But, and here's something that has to be considered. One of the things that Cotton Mather says, and he has a lengthy interview with her two weeks after she gets back to Haverhill, she is invited to Boston. It would have been like meeting the president. I mean, he was the most significant intellectual in that period in Boston, and Boston was the center of the English-speaking world and the new world. She gets invited to speak to Cotton Mather. He interviews her at length. And he writes probably about a 2,500-word account that comes right from her mouth. And a lot of the key details I use in the narrative are the things that she tells Mather during that meeting, which probably took place in mid-April 1697. He writes down the facts as she presented them to him, but then he adds his own explanation. And he obviously, because he's a minister and he's using this for a sermon, he's trying to come up with a justification that proves that the Puritans are favored by God as opposed to the French who were the Jesuits, you know, the Catholics versus the Protestants. And he says in his first account, which he repeats in three subsequent books that were published early in the 18th century, he says, since she felt protected by no law, she felt hindered by no law once she was in the wilderness. So in other words, if this is the way they're going to fight, and now she's in the wilderness, which to the Puritan mind, if you look at Hawthorne and other writers that covered the period, the wilderness is Satan's land. And the savages, so-called, the Native Americans, are Satan's emissaries. So she has no compunction to do to them what she saw them do to the elderly and to the sick and to the infants in her community, because she's not in the English-speaking world, she's in their world. And that's how Mather justifies it in his famous sermon, which is based on his interview with her. And that's the question I wrestled with. Is she a prototypical feminist avenger, or is she the harbinger of the Native American genocide? Because she decides that the only answer to what they've done, and the only answer to the fact over who's going to have sovereignty over the land, is total annihilation of everybody on that island. It's like, what's going to happen in manifest destiny in microcosm? That's, that's what her story's about. So that's the first half of my answer, and the second half of my answer is related to 
how do I tell the story in such a way that it comes alive? And how do I tell the story using the facts and using research into weaponry, Indian tactics, how to build a birch bark canoe, what the Indian shelter would be like, what their weapons look like. So as I did this research into the colonial weaponry, both on the English side, the French side, what the Indians used as weapons, it finally occurred to me after two years in the library, most of it spent in the Haverhill Historical Society and the Haverhill Library Special Collections Room, trying to look at all these old genealogies, all these original histories of Haverhill from the late 18th and early 19th century. I realized that studying these events and studying the world view of the Puritans and the Jesuits at that time was only half the story. In order to tell the story and really immerse the reader in Hannah's experience and immerse the reader in the period that she lived in, two things had to occur. You have to look at the story through the preconceptions and the prejudices of the 17th century settlers, not through a politically correct lens of 2016. And you also had to tell the story through the landscape, that it's not an intellectual story. It's not some kind of overview of, say, colonial America and the forces driving it. It's one woman's savage response to the savagery that was inflicted upon her. And it was a brutal time and there was brutality on all sides. So the Indians are not at fault. The Abenaki are not the villains. The French aren't even the villains. The English aren't the villains. They are inflicting brutality on each other in a way that's almost unfathomable to us today. And the other thing is the landscape that we see now in northeastern Massachusetts, although it's still studded with large swaths of open land, large segments of undeveloped forest still, rivers and streams, it's a genteel place. You can see the smoke coming up from chimneys. There's lots of nice houses. There's lots of strip malls. You can't imagine the landscape that we appreciate. So if somebody visits me from another part of the country, I take them out and let them take a look at the White Mountains of New Hampshire, which is one of the places that Hannah Dustin was headed towards. The Merrimack River Valley, like what a beautiful place it is. Our appreciation of the landscape in the 21st century was preceded by a constant appraisal of the landscape by the 17th century settlers. Their appraisal was based on trying to measure the threats that lay within the landscape. It wasn't just the threats of warriors coming down in war parties and terrorizing the village. If you had one bad crop and you had 12 children, people were going to starve to death. If one of your kids stepped on a rusty tool, he was going to die. If the Indians came down, they didn't raid your house, but they burned down your cornfield, people were going to die of starvation. The winter seemed to last because they had no central heating and they had no down jackets and no SUVs. The winter seemed to last from November until April. And even by my own experience, snowshoeing, mountain biking, and cross-country skiing, large segments of the likely route that Dustin would have been forced along as she was moved from Haverhill, Massachusetts to a place on the Merrimack River north of Concord. It was harsh, and some days I would cut my six miles short and make it four miles because even with my modern equipment and modern clothing and cliff bars and all the other things I needed, it was uncomfortable. So to think... What was it like for someone who was half-starved, living off ground nuts that were buried in semi-frozen ground, picking skin off the bottom of her feet, in drenched woolen clothing, a week after they'd killed their infant, not knowing what her husband and children had gone through, whether they were even alive or not, the story has to be told through the landscape because the landscape was the biggest threat to her life. And that's where I decided in the final year, the three years, I was going to hike, snowshoe, and canoe a big section of the river that she took when she fled from the island after she killed the Indians. My guest is Jay Atkinson, and the book is Massacre on the Merrimack, Hannah Dustin's Captivity and Revenge in Colonial America. 
His website is jatkinson.com, and you can catch him on social media. Atkinson underscore J is the Twitter handle, and facebook.com slash writer J Atkinson. Publishers Weekly writes of Massacre on the Merrimack, quote, a strong sense of place and vivid narration underscore journalist Atkinson's tale of war, survival, and murder in colonial Massachusetts. By the way, Cotton Mather, he's five years here after the Salem witch trials, where, of course, he gained infamy. And we talked about him some, or we'll talk about him with the author Stephen Koss of The Fever of 1721. And that's another thing they would face here would be disease. This was like every 12 years in Boston, they would have just a smallpox outbreak and it would kill hundreds of people. And as you were talking there about how the Native Americans would have lived, no wonder they were hard, tough people. No, maybe an infant as horrible as the crime of murdering one against a tree would be to modern people who we don't even kill our own chickens or our own cows for the most part. Right. Maybe if you live in a world where infants are dying at, you know, maybe almost 100 percent mortality rate if they have the bad luck to be born in the winter. And maybe it's not something that you recoil at. Not, not to make excuses for any of it. There's obviously so many atrocities on both sides. There's something you mentioned called the sham war in the book where the the Pentecook, is it? The Pentecook. Yeah. Right. The, and they you know, they bring them in. They say, oh, hey, trust these English. They're, they've been our allies. And then they betray them all. And it's just. They're going to do like a festival and let them yeah. participate in a mock battle and fire the cannons. And then they turn the cannons on the Indians. Yeah. So there's plenty to go around. And I think of a lot of people sort of maybe reading the book and. You just recoil at it, and it's easy to call it political correctness, I guess, but people are legitimately bothered by these things, by the violence, and they want to think and do the right thing. But I would encourage them just to read here, Massacre on the Merrimack, and try to put yourself in those shoes or the one shoe and walk through the snow. Imagine when we complain now if we're not wearing the right shoes. Imagine wearing one shoe. You know, Imagine never having shoes if you're a member of the Native tribe. So you really go here down the Merrimack River, and you experience all of this. You experience the land. And to mention another author, Timothy H. Breen, from Up Your Way There, his book, Washington's Journey, he talked about being told by a historian when he was coming up that you have to walk the land because if you don't know and see and feel what they did, you have to experience it. And so you have one really moving part of the book where you talk about being in the canoe and they, Hannah, they're making their escape here. Hannah and Mary Neff and the young boy, Lenoris and Sam Lenorison, and they lose a paddle. So I wondered when you were going down the river there, did you try it with one paddle or was the river still just as much of a challenge? It was to dangerous have? enough with two paddles. I'll yeah. tell you that. <laughs> I did it two years in a row. I did it in March 30th, 2015. I was with my good friend, Christopher Pierce, longtime rugby teammate, expert paddler, and a hardcore outdoorsman. We had modern equipment. You know, we had a fiberglass canoe, not a birch bark canoe. We had dry suits, wet suits, PFDs, personal flotation devices. We had food for the day. You know, we were equipped. And we still, and with the experience we have in the outdoors in the winter, we were taken aback by what we saw. When we launched our canoe from Sugarball Island, which is the place where Hannah Dustin killed her captors and escaped downriver, the river was a half mile over its banks on both sides. There were trees floating by, chunks of ice. The water was so cold that even with the equipment we had on, if we rolled the canoe and we fell in the water, chances are we were going to go hypothermic before either of us, who were both pretty good swimmers, could make it to shore. So I knew immediately this was the right thing to do for the book. Like, if I do this canoe trip, I'm going to be able to describe the canoe trip in a way that you couldn't do just by sitting in a library or even by driving your car along the road wherever it was close to the Merrimack River and looking at the river. Because it was a long, exciting, grueling, fatiguing day, and there was about three or four sets of rapids that we hit on our eight-hour paddle that first day. And they were really tricky because even though they wouldn't be, you know, they'd only be like level two or something like that, because of the cold water and because of the precariousness of our situation, places where the river's nowhere near the road, nowhere near any houses, that if we dumped the canoe in those, even in those relatively mild rapids, we were going to be in real trouble. So going down river was hard enough. When we got to where we'd left our second vehicle as the sun was going down, the first time I took the trip, 
we found that the bank was about six feet high. It was undercut with trees, and there were roots hanging out. There was no place to land the canoe where we could get out safely. So my friend said, look, I'll steady the canoe with my paddle by sticking it in the roots of these trees underneath the bank, holding us as steady as you can. You gradually, slowly stand up, grab a tree branch, do a pull up and kip over, and then I'll hand you up the paddle. Then you steady the canoe from above and you like make it so I can reach up and grab the tree branch. Well, what happened was he was 220 pounds in the canoe and he could steady the canoe pretty well for me to stand up. I was just using a canoe paddle bent over the bank trying to steady the canoe, and he fell in the water. So Chris fell in the water up to his chest, and he's a tough guy, former All-American wrestler from Ithaca, and he went instantly blanched white. His lips went white. He started to hyperventilate, and he goes, I can't blankety-blank believe it. I'm going hypothermic almost immediately. Wow. So... He had to jump out of there. I had to yank him up onto the bank. We had to pull the canoe up, and the dry bags almost went in the river, get all our stuff on the bank. He stripped naked, put on a set of dry clothes, and ran off through the woods because he said, if I don't get moving and get to where the car is and start up our car and come back for you, I'm going to be in big trouble. So that was that was an eye-opening thing. That was like, okay, now I can see a little bit what it was like. Now, this past year, 2015, the New York Times hired me to write an adventure travel piece to tie into the book, which people can see either on my Facebook page or on the New York Times travel section online. We did an overnight trip. So we started from the same place we started the year before. Last winter was enormously hard winter in New England with a lot of snow melt because we had so much snow. The river was even wider deeper, broader, and scarier than it was the year before. We paddled all day, and then we found one of those unnamed tiny sliver islands in the middle of the river. It's about 300 yards long, shaped kind of like an almond with a lot of bramble and underbrush and all snow on it, and we barely managed to land the canoe on the island, set up our tent, and it was 18 degrees that night. We got in our sleeping bags and changed our clothes and birthed the canoe safely, and we laid there at 8 o'clock at night, you know, shoulder to shoulder in this two-man tent, staring at the ceiling, saying, I'm not freezing to death, but it's too cold to sleep. So basically, we were up all night, and at one point, Chris said, let's just get up and take a walk around the island to get warm. So we got up, put our outerwear back on, put our boots back on, started walking around the island. And we started to warm up a little bit, and it had been snowing on and off during the day. And at night, a quarter moon came out, and you could see the river uh, really well. And we got to the downriver part of the island on a little shoal, and we were standing there looking out at this huge, massive black flow of water with trees and chunks of ice going by. And we were just sitting there contemplating it for a few minutes without saying a word. And Chris said, some people are just survivors, man. She had to have some kind of metal to get through this experience. Just the river trip alone, forget about the fact that she thought the Indians were chasing her. She was a remarkable person, and I think if we could somehow be transported back in time and we could talk to her, we wouldn't recognize her as even being part of the same species as us. It would be like her inner strength, and like you described it as her stoicism and her sort of like steadfast, plodding like way that she went about wreaking her revenge is just something that's totally alien to us. So we can't put it in 21st century terms. I kept coming back to that. Like there was brutality on all sides. There were no good guys and no villains. Everybody was trying to survive. It seemed to me that when you say she went through all that and she's bare armed you know she's just just in her shirt and gown when they grab her there i mean she's she's not even left bed really yet from giving birth to martha and right. she manages to be a really tough i think when you think of these farm women that's kind of what you think of she's really just tough and 
she really wants no part of this and they want no part of her afterwards, which I found fascinating that they just they never went by their house again. They never tried to raid it after this, because one of the things you mentioned is that the Abenaki don't have a written language, but she left word pictures that they would have used all over that island when they come. And they must have said, oh, my gosh, what? You know, they have their own beliefs and their own things that they're thinking about these people that are suddenly now arriving in their continent and living everywhere. So. I thought that that was another thing that made me open my eyes here a little bit and say, I never thought of how they looked at the woods until I read it here in Massacre on the Merrimack, that they looked at them as sort of agents of the devil. And then I never really thought of how the native people would have looked at these people who suddenly showed up. I mean, and we see that with first contacts or with different cultures running into each other all the time. It's just... I think we're so desperate to maybe see this in a Hollywood way or so accustomed to it. I I I don't want to condescend anyone. As I said, this book certainly makes you think a lot, which is one reason I really enjoyed it. But I was thinking, compare her slavery experience with how we feel about the Amistad uprising. You know, when we watch that scene in Amistad, I don't think any of us think, well, maybe the slaves could have spared a few of those sailors they, they were they were taking them and selling them into slavery right, right. and they were going to their life would have been destroyed and they'd killed their friends and so i said that's kind of an interesting thing to ponder and i hope that people as we say socrates said it, the unexamined life is not worth living so here this is a book you can examine those sort of things say well, what would you have done back in those times would you have been tough enough would you even be tough enough to do what you did and you have that new york times piece i did read it and we'll link to it at historyauthor.com when we put this all up but i don't even know if i'd be tough enough to do what you did and i'm sure most people are saying laying in a two man tent i mean if you've ever been in a two man tent again going back to our childhood you're quite a bit bigger now so <laughs> to be laying yeah. in a tent and not having to get up and move. Right now, we only get up and move when we want to get something out of the fridge, right? Like We don't have to move all the time. We don't think about our food comes in cellophane. We don't kill our own animals. We don't see death. If uh, We take it for granted now that children are going to live from infancy and they're going to become adults. And And they're going to outlive us. Yeah. In most cases, you know, it's the natural order of things that our children are going to bury us. And they saw the world like totally different than that. I mean, People were killed in odd ways all the time. The Native American raids being the very least of the horrors that, you know, the very least expected or the least frequent horrors that were that were visited upon, like these outer colonies during that period. The other thing to keep in mind is, for 80 years, Haverhill, Massachusetts, up near the northeast corner, was the outermost vanguard of the English-speaking world. There were a couple of very small settlements in southern Maine. There was Newbury, Massachusetts to the east, and then somewhat north and to the west was Durham, New Hampshire, and Exeter, New Hampshire. There were small settlements there. But for 80 years, there was nothing between Haverhill and the Chateau in Quebec, except the wilderness, which was populated by roving bands of different tribes. So that's something to keep in mind. The other anecdote I think that's worth telling is when we talk about, like, who's to blame and looking at it in a politically correct way, there was some, like, discussion when I was writing the piece, well, you should call the Abenaki the native inhabitants, or you should call them the Native Americans. You shouldn't call them the Indians, and you should never refer to them as the savages. And I said, but I'm not looking at it from 2015. I'm looking at it from the... Native Americans' perspective then looking at the whites, and the whites' perspective then looking at the Native Americans. So I use the terminology of the period during the narrative sections of the book to immerse you in the book, and in the discursive parts of the book where I give you the overview of like the conflict between the French fur trapping economy and the English agrarian economy and the two different strategies for settling the New World, then I move out of that. I move out of that language of the 17th century into a more like modern view of what happened. But the anecdote I wanted to share is that every year there's a meeting of the Dustin Family Association in Haverhill, Massachusetts, and they gather at the Garrison House and they have a weekend of events where they have lectures and speakers, and then they take a bus ride up to where the island is that she escaped from, and then they go to the Garrison House and have a cocktail party there. So I've been invited to speak to them a couple times. There's over 400 members. Usually 100 or so members come to Haverhill every summer. Are these descendants, some of them? Because I know she left. They're all direct descendants. Wow. When she died, she had 64 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. Wow. Because she had 13 children, 10 of whom survived, and a lot of them had families, and a lot of them still live in the area. 
although some of these relatives come from as far away as Florida and Texas and Minnesota. The rock band Heart, the two women, one of them is a direct descendant of Hannah Dustin and has visited Haverhill during this festival, like this annual like meeting of huh. the Dustin Family Association. They are sisters, so they would both be related. So I was giving a talk two years ago when I was in the middle of the research for the book. I was there to talk about my research. And then afterwards, I was chatting with a very well-educated guy who was an eighth great, 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 great grandson of Hannah Dustin, retired museum curator with an advanced degree. And I had now got to the point where I was really looking at it from both sides. I mean, the Indians certainly got like the raw end of the deal in the new world since we basically eradicated their civilization over time. And in this particular episode, although they did wreak havoc on Haverhill, havoc was wreaked upon them by Hannah Dustin. So I was basically telling this person, we were having this sort of discussion over, you know, spring water and coffee about, oh, let's look at it from the Indian side. Let's look at it from their perspective. And he said, and this guy had written a a unpublished book of genealogy of the Dustin family, and I gave me a copy of it, and I had all the benefit of his 20 years research on some of these arcane facts and some of these very small diary entries from some of Dustin's contemporaries. This guy was a major help to me in writing the book. But when I mentioned something about let's have let's try to look at it from the Abenaki's point of view, he cut me off. And uncharacteristically, he scowled and he said they were nothing but vicious slavers, and I have no sympathy for them whatsoever. Hmm. That took me aback, and I said, well, I have to point this out. If you're going to call them vicious slavers, the research that I did indicated that at the time of Hannah's captivity, that other families in Haverhill, not the Dustins, because they did not have enough money, Other families in Haverhill had an aggregate of 12 African-American slaves. So you could say that the residents of Haverhill were vicious slavers, too. And the guy turned on his heel and walked away. He was mad. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's always interesting. I find when people read history and they decide when they want to start the story. I mean, yes, if we maybe if we just start the story when your book starts in the middle of a raid and it's just a family and you think, gosh, they're just there trying to make a living, it's their house. But then you spin back a little ways and you say, well, okay, the Native Americans were there first and these people are building and they're encroaching and look at all the things that they did to them, like with the sham fight, you know, that kind of thing. But then again, if you go back a little before the European contact, one of the reasons there aren't so many Native Americans there to greet the colonists is because they've just been fighting wars amongst themselves and it really decimates their population. So, And and they had what was probably Probably influenza that wiped out like most of the Native American population in our part of the state, northeastern Massachusetts and most of Connecticut and Vermont. They were killed off by disease. There were so many people that succumbed to disease that explorers that were sailing along the main coast from either England, France, Spain, depending on which explorers they were, saw that there was wigwams or Indian, you know, shelters with bleached bones that people had died so rapidly in such great numbers they couldn't even bury the dead. And that was illness. That was disease. Now, that disease could have been carried to the New World by explorers and fur trappers and spread, like, by accident because they would not be immune to any of these European diseases. And one of the things that happens, too, is I examine the facsimile of the original deed granting the large parcel of land, which encompassed at the time what's now 10 different towns in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. That was all called Haverhill then. And a dozen or so settlers from Newbury, Mass., came over to the fishing weirs in Haverhill and negotiated with the last two remaining local Pentucket Indians, or the two families. One was named Passaquo, and the other one was named Sagahue. And on the facsimile of deed, they signed with little drawings of bow and arrow. That was their signatures. And they were paid a certain amount of money. And this little land transaction is just one of thousands that will take place between the white settlers and the Native Americans over the next 200 years. But it's indicative and emblematic of the other ones because what the Indians thought they were selling and what the white settlers thought they were buying were two different things. The Indians didn't see land ownership as something that was even possible. 
the land was actually part of the Great Spirit. Everything was alive. Every rock, every stick, every tree had as much right to live as any human being. What they thought they were selling was shared domicile. They were giving the Indians in exchange for a small amount of money and some other consideration, perhaps goods or food, access to the fishing weirs, not dominion over the fishing weirs. So the English land ownership titles and deeds go back hundreds of years to the Middle Ages. The English thought they were buying total and sovereign dominion over the land, just like now when you buy a house, when you move in, you don't expect a family that's still living there to be there, and they're out. You now own the land. So the distinction between what the Indians thought they were giving up and what the whites thought they were getting caused a lot of the friction and a lot of the death and betrayal that unspools beginning with King Philip's War and the early wars of the colonial period and spreads all the way out through Custer's debacle and all the other like sad chapters of the eradication of the Native American population going almost up to the 20th century. It's amazing how Hannah's story stands as a microcosm of, at least it does in my mind after thinking about it for three years, stands as microcosm of the American story. It's like Here's what we did and how we did it and why we did it. And here it is in in a small scale that we can read in 220 pages. And I think understand a little bit more about the fog of history that hangs over like us trying to understand from 2016 what they were experiencing in 1697. It's so hard to bridge that gap. And like I say, the only way to bridge it, I think, is through trying to see the landscape through their eyes. I think one point that should be made is you talk about signing a deed. You talk about not being able to sign your name. This is not just like being illiterate, say. There were plenty of people that were illiterate, certainly in the colonies there. A lot of people didn't write, but they had a concept of a writing and a written language. The Native Americans we're talking about here, they don't even have a concept of a written language. So if you don't have that, how can you possibly sign your name to a contract? Right. How do you even know what a contract is? We know it very easily. And I just love those moments. You can really keep going back to this book. I mean, if people have a book club out there, I would highly recommend Massacre on the Merrimack. Just make sure you like all the people there and everybody's willing to just come at it and really say, how much do you know? You know, how, what do you really think about these things? My gosh, uh, somebody who doesn't know what a contract is just sounds incredible. But I also want to let people know that you weave in a couple of other stories that I just want to sort of mention in passing or give people a little taste. There's another Hannah in your book, Hannah Bradley. She has the misfortune to be captured twice. and she From Haverhill, yeah, yeah. She's Hannah Dustin's neighbor. It's taken twice within a six-year period and spends a year or, or more each time as sort of like an indentured servant in the French colony. You know, in Quebec and her husband both times has to come and basically pay like bribe money to get her out of there. And then one time they go by ship and the other time they walk wow. all the way back from Quebec to Haverhill, Massachusetts. You know, so she's taken the same day as Hannah, and she's not with Hannah's party when Hannah wreaks her revenge on the Indians that were holding her and escapes. She's with a different party, and she has to walk all the way to French Canada. Now, when she's taken again in the early 18th century, she's pregnant with child. She delivers the child on the march, and they kill the baby. So, yeah, even more cruelly than Martha, I would mention, too. Really horrible way that they kill that baby. Yeah, and then, you know, so she survives... Her, she has a different kind of fortitude and resilience than Han is. I mean, you might say, well, she's passive. She gets taken prisoner twice, but and she doesn't try to resist. But what chance do you have? In most cases, you don't have much opportunity to get away. You're just trying to survive day to day. And in a way, it's like the Stockholm Syndrome. Your captors are your only friends. Like you have to follow them, and if they leave a little piece of uneaten meat or gristle, like you eat that. I mean, so she can't survive in that landscape without her captors, which is kind of frightening to think about. Then come into the end of the first decade of the 18th century, and Haverhill is raided again, and they pick the Bradleys again. So, like, she's been taken captive twice sold in bond twice and then rescued by her husband and paid out the bond to release her twice. And they now live in a fortified house. They have two militia living with them. Her children, you know, some of them are dead now. It's her and her husband. They see three or four Indians slip over the palisaded wall and rush their front door. And Hannah Bradley tells her husband, 
I'm not going to be taken again alive. And the four Indians quite ferociously rushed the front door, which is a barricaded door, and they managed to, like, fracture the door part way. And one of the Indians sticks his head and shoulders through to try to unloosen the bolt, and she shoots him with a large bore rifle right in the face from close range. Like, I'm not going again. This is it. You're either taking me here or that's it. Now, when you said earlier that there were subsequent raids and they didn't, ever raid the Dustin house again. They never went after Hannah again. There's an interesting anecdote about that because on Sugar Ball Island, what's now called the Hannah Dustin Historic Site in New Hampshire, which anybody could look at on Google Maps, that's then called Sugar Ball Island. That was the island from which we launched our canoe trips and from which she launched her escape. In 1889, the first statue was raised to Hannah Dustin on what was then called Sugar Ball Island, now called the Hannah Dustin Historic Site in New Hampshire. And it was erroneously referred to as the first publicly funded statue to an American woman. Remember that Hawthorne and Whittier and Thoreau and Mather all wrote about Hannah Dustin. She was a well-known figure, and she was taught in schools from the 17th century through most of the 19th century. It's only in the 20th century that we sort of forget about her. When she becomes, with her ferocious response to her captivity, she becomes kind of an embarrassment to American motherhood, which has now been supplanted by Grandma Moses in a rocking chair, the idea of like the genteel mother who stays at home with her children. Robert Caverly is a lawyer and poet from Lowell, Massachusetts. He raises the funds privately. There is no publicly funded statue to Hannah Dustin on the island. It's money that Caverly raised. He hires a Lowell sculptor, William Andrews, to make this original statue of Hannah Dustin, and they dedicate it in a ceremony in the late 1880s on the island. Robert Caverly was a sort of local historian and attorney and just a really bad poet because some of what he wrote was like <laughs> these long, really dull epic poems about Hannah Dustin. The most interesting thing about Robert Caverly's book, which is called The Heroism of Hannah Dustin, is the afterword where he reprints his speech. It's just the three pages, last three pages of the book. He reprints the speech that he gave in dedicating the, the Dustin statue on the island that day in 1889. And one of the things he says, it's one of the few, there's a few poetic turns of phrase that he gives during that speech that is actually better than any of his poetry. He says, the Indians you know, never approached the Dustin house again, even though they were to raid Haverhill two more times in fourth and a few other times in small forays against the village, because they had already learned that in disturbing Hannah Dustin in her house, that March morning in 1697, they were, quote, waking up the wrong passenger, unquote. Wow. <laughs> so I guess the lack of written language, as we said, they certainly got the word pictures that she left all over that island. That must have been strange to sleep there. I hope people will do what you said and go on Google Maps and just imagine. I mean, as you said, it is still a lot of wilderness around there now. You wouldn't want to walk that on modern roads, much less do what she did. There's another story in the book, though, that I encourage people to read. Joseph Whitaker and Isaac Bradley, 11 and 15. We talked about the Bradleys a minute ago. They have their incredible escape. When I said that Massacre on the Merrimack reads like a thriller, it's never more true than in their flight to freedom. So I thank you so much for recreating their story. It's one I think I'll think of every time now when it snows. So Jay Atkinson, author of Massacre on the Merrimack, thank you for bringing Hannah Dustin's statue to life, sharing this story with us today and giving us a lot to think about. Thanks for the opportunity to share her story because I think it's a forgotten chapter in American history that needs to be remembered. Not only as tribute to her and her fortitude and her resilience as an early, you know, New Englander, but also as a way, like I say, in miniature to try to understand the bigger American story. The history of every new civilization is a history of bloodshed and murder. Our country isn't any different, and the origins of our settlement in New England isn't any different than the settlement of any other sovereign country throughout history. It's just interesting to think about it through the perspective of this one resolute 39-year-old woman. And for that, I thank you for the opportunity to tell that story. Well, I appreciate it. And it's the least we could do is read the book after you and Chris suffered there in that tent. So thank you again. <laughs> I look forward to talking about your next book when it comes out. 
Thanks very much, Dave. Maybe, maybe study the story of somebody in the Caribbean. Just an idea I'm throwing. <laughs> Some place where you could go to an island and have a cocktail and think about yep, it. Yep, I look forward to talking to you again. Thanks. Again, the book is Massacre on the Merrimack, Hannah Dustin's Captivity and Revenge in Colonial America. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase the book at historyauthor.com, and we hope you will click through there, or even bookmark our URL off the homepage for all your online purchases. Amazon gives us a few pennies off every purchase you make, and it doesn't cost you anything. My sincere thanks to Jay Atkinson for joining me and for sharing the complex story of Hannah Dustin and the culture clash in the New World a century before the American Revolution. Please remember to visit him at jayatkinson.com, follow him at Atkinson underscore J on Twitter, and drop him a like at facebook.com slash writer J Atkinson. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean. I have a feeling people are going to have a lot of opinions on this one, and I'm open to all of them. I want you to enjoy the show, so if you like how I did this or don't like how I did it, do let me know, and I'm sure Jay feels exactly the same way. Well, that's it for this week's installment of the History Authors Show. I hope you'll join us next week for another trip into the past here on iHeartRadio, or wherever you're listening. If you do subscribe to us on iTunes, please leave a review. Well, until next Monday morning, thanks so much for listening. And happy reading. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.